My friends, it is such a joy to see a packed room today for us to celebrate the release of Leon Aaron's outstanding new book, Riding the Tiger. Our conversation today is part of the Edward and Helen Hintz book series here at AEI uh, that promotes books of national and international importance, of which this latest book is a fabulous example. And we're very grateful to Edward and Helen Hintz for their support of this kind of scholarship. So, 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 Le Dr. Leon Aaron uh, came to the United States in the late 1970s as a refugee from Russia. He also did his undergraduate work at Moscow State University, but slummed it at Columbia for his graduate work, which is in uh, political sociology, which I feel like that's the plumb line running through your work. Because even when you are writing biography, like your outstanding book of Yeltsin, it really is more about the culture and sociology of Russia that's producing these kinds of leaders. So with that, tell us about this particular political sociology. Well, uh, thank you very much, Corey, for being here, finding the time uh, to be here, and also for all your support um, while I was, I was writing this book. It is not only my pleasure, it's my actual job. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's, um, I, th I think each of the uh, chapters of this book um, could, be, uh, could be a separate book. Uh, but I wanted to give the readers uh, um, a, a kind of a, a, a quick but memorable tour of the house that Putin built. And, and uh, you know, if you think of the key concepts, ideas, um, uh, uh, policies as, as colorful tiles. I try to line them up and then cohere them in, in, a, in, a, in a, a portrait. And speaking of which, uh, there are about two dozen photos. Um, <laughs> and we're going to show you some of them before <laughs> this is over Two today. dozen photos uh, as we go along. Um, uh, uh, the people who know more about technology than I will, will do it. Um, the, we, took, uh, we took some of those photos uh, straight from the net, and the idea here was to uh, show uh, rather than tell. Um, it, that's, that's the theme that permeates the book. Um, it's entirely based on uh, raw <laughs> intelligence. Uh, it's all uh, Russian sources, and uh, um, lots, of, lots of horses and lots of mouths I, 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 had, to, I had to listen to and look into. Um, a couple of things uh, preliminary. Uh, the book was uh, written uh, before, uh, or, or, rather, or rather, I started writing uh, the concept, as you remember, um, uh, was around 2018. At that time, the book was titled A Short Victorious War. I knew that there was going to be a war. Uh, at that time, I, I was considered uh, an outlier and, and, and a bit nuts. Um, nobody believed that Putin would start a war. But this brings me to the theme of the book. And the theme of the book is how essentially one man um, uh, primed a, a great and large country for war. Uh, and, and that's the tiger. Um, uh, he saddled the tiger of militarized patriotism. And, and uh, I think uh, the adjacent uh, scholars, political scientists, uh, call it path dependency, and, and it's very difficult to get off that tiger. That tiger took him um, to Ukraine. Uh, I think the relevance of this book, even though, even though I finished it after the invasion, is first because it shows how he got there, but it also, I think, um, relevant because sooner or later, the war will be over. Um, and, but the... the uh, 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 the Russia that Putin forged will stay with us. And, and I tried to show uh, what sort of country he created and, and what sort of a toxic uh, mix he pumped into uh, his people. 
So I realized I neglected to say, hi, I'm Corey Shockey. I lead the foreign and defense policy team here at the American <laughs> Enterprise Institute. Um, but uh, tacking back to this serious conversation, so it sounds like your judgment is that we don't just have a Putin problem, but because we have had a Putin problem, we now also have a Russia problem. Uh, Corey, one of the things that that struck me, and 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 of course, you know, if 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 a book you write, uh, first of all, does not evolve sometimes 180 degrees from from <laughs> <laughs> from your original uh, idea, then it's not a good book. You're not thinking uh, your way through. Yeah, right. uh, and secondly, if you're not surprised by 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 what this book tells you, then then again, it's not a particularly good book. One of the things that surprised me, although there were several things is um, precisely that, and that is that uh, it's, it's not a new idea, but, but goodness, this was really uh, Exhibit A. How in a, in a country with a um, uh, weak tradition of civil, civil society, weak tradition of um, uh, self-organization, how quickly and almost painlessly, uh, elites could turn around that country and that public opinion. Mm -hmm. and, and Putin proved a very skillful demagogue, uh, largely, I think, in part because although he positioned himself as, as the Soviet, I'm sorry, as the Russian patriot, uh, you know, late 99 and 2000, he is, in fact, a fervent Soviet patriot. And the humiliation um, of the fall from the superpowership, the trauma of, of the end of the exclusive, or at least that's what they ha had considered, their exclusive, exalted position in the world as a counterpart, incidentally, not just political, geopolitical, or military, but moral to the United States, which of course is the only country that matters to Russia. Uh, th that, that the Democrats of the 90s um, and late 80s underestimated the trauma, he felt it. And he, among other things, played up and, and kind of parasitized on the humiliation that people felt. And humiliation could be, uh, uh, a source of a very effective, albeit dark power. I mean, Hitler and, 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 and Germany after the defeat in, in World War I. Um, there are other, there are many examples of this. So he, um, he, he felt it, he played it up, and of course, in the end, he told the Russians, not only will I defend you, but I will restore um, the glory of the Soviet Union, I will recover for you the, not just, that's his domestic agenda, political and economic assets that were lost in the Soviet collapse, but I will recover for you the geostrategic assets as well. And we know from the public opinion polls that, which um, I, I actually cite rather extensively in the book, that he was widely successful. And um, you mentioned kind of the fragility of, of, of institutions in a time of transition. What about the role of civil society? Because I think of that as the superpower of freedom and a buffer in, in societies in which freedom is more established, and especially in the rambunctiousness of this society. Would would a stronger civil society, was a stronger civil society possible? Namely, did we miss opportunities? Did Russians miss opportunities? And uh, do you think it would have made any difference? Or was the power of the storm that Putin has unleashed in Russian society going to have overpowered even that? I think there was a, uh uh, a really burgeoning civil society at the end of the 80s uh, and in the 90s, what I call the Gorbachev-Yeltsin revolution. Uh, uh, I've written, uh, um, there's a collection of essays called Russia's Revolution. Uh, I, uh, 
I uh, uh, um, um, collected some some of the pieces that I wrote. It was amazing. I mean, they, the the politics were burgeoning. The there was an absolute freedom of the press. Um, there was a unleashed private initiative. Uh, the art, the culture, just boomed. Um, but I. I, I think it was not enough. That 10 years is not enough. Um, and, and there was, uh, um, you know, there was an actual resistance, of course, along the way. But remember, Putin uh, went very cleverly about this. So if we look at it as, as and it was that, and it was many other things, but it was certainly, it could be considered part of a reactionary restoration that follows uh, any great revolution. Mm -hmm. and, and here, it, those restorations are never sort of about the blanket negations of what happened. I mean, if you look at, the, you know, at, the, at, at what happened after the French Revolution, the British Revolution, and of course, Iranian. the Russian Revolution, uh, rather, they leave certain institutions uh, 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 as they were, certain institutions that, that revolutions brought about, but they hollowed them out. They corrupted them. They, they kind of uh, destabilized them from within. And what Putin did was he left um, um, the Constitution. He left um, the Duma, he left the Parliament. Uh, but with, within the first two terms, 2000 to 2008, uh, they became a shell. Uh, uh, one of the things I think he discovered, for one, that that uh, 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 money works sometimes is more effective than terror, mm -hmm. and so and so uh, the leaders of the parties, uh, some of some of the people I see in this in this room studied with me the uh, uh, what happened in the 90s. Goodness, the communists of of the Russian Federation were fire breathing dragons. I mean, they were after Yeltsin. You know, remember uh, Yeltsin was was almost impeached twice in in the, in the Duma vote. Uh, so, something so, that's sounding outlandish, uh, absolutely fantastic today. But but what happened? What happened? In fact, I was wondering. Uh, you know, 2017 is of course the hundredth anniversary of the Great October Revolution, which under different circumstances would have been sort of a a, 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 a fire. Uh, of, of, of a firestorm of red banners and, 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 and speeches. And nothing, nothing, nothing happened in 2017. That is really interesting. And so there are threats, there are uh, um, um, uh, money, uh, uh, there is money, there, there are threats, uh, there are also uh, uh, very real possibility that you'll go to jail on some fantastic uh, uh, term. There was a, um, a story recently uh, about a, a, an unnamed member, uh, member um, of uh, uh, the Russian uh, parliament, the Duma, the lower house, who came to uh, uh, the deputy director for domestic politics, the guy by the name of Kiryenko, and he said, I can't take it anymore. I I'm resigning. Uh, two days later, uh, 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 there was a, a, a raid of his son's business hmm. and his wife's business as well. And on the third day, he came back to Kiryenka and he said, sorry, I, I, I take it back. And Kiryenka, Kiryenka said, no, хорошо. Very good. Uh, uh, excellent. And, uh, and that is how Putin structured that system. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, the, the, the hollowing out, and of course, you know, one by one by one, the formerly terrific uh, Russian uh, uh, television, including the NTV, which probably was the, one of the world's best, uh, uh, most professionally made uh, and staffed by truly talented people. Uh, I remember, um, I believe it was very early in, push, in Putin's rule, 2000 and 2001, when uh, they, they took over the NTV. There was a protest at the Pushkin Square um, in Moscow. Several thousand people came. Everybody uh, was, uh, reg regretted it, and that's where it ended. Uh, and that, that links the distinction between manipulation of elites 
and how you get that dynamic taking hold in the broader society. Uh, intimidating protesters, jailing a few thousand people from a protest, Kasapov, what else did they do? What else did Putin and his apparatchiks do on the broad public scale that, that stamped it out? Well, um, you know, there, you, you go by example. Um, uh, you know, you, you arrest and then try twice um, for a very lengthy prison term, the richest man in Russia, uh, uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, you take over the largest and most modern Russian company, Yukas, and through a set of rigged uh, uh, auctions, essentially the state uh, uh, becomes the owner. Um, you have other examples. Um, you you um, uh, take, like I said, you take over the NTV. Um, you don't, you know, these days, of course, you, you are repressed. What, what's interesting is that uh, Putin now brought that, that, um, his Russia to a more repressive uh, state than was the late Soviet Union. Wow. I mean, I don't remember in the 70s the terms of 25 years in jail, uh, uh, as, as Alexei Navalny is now serving, or 19 years as, as my dear friend uh, Valody Karamurza is serving. Uh, they simply didn't exist. I mean, those types of terms were only for uh, turned spies or, or treasoners, but they, <laughs> you didn't need the term, they just shot them. Um, so so th he, he is now, now it's in a much more naked uh, display of force. But before, remember, uh, Corey, I said that, that the overarching goal of, of Putin's rule uh, certainly first two terms, was to recover for his state, the new Russia, um, the geopolitical, uh, domestic political, and economic assets that were lost in the Soviet collapse. And so he proceeded very methodically. He started with what Lenin called the uh, commanding heights of the economy, gas, oil, um, uh, largest companies. And the message, you were asking me how he's done it, the message after the Khodorkovsky arrest was to all the so-called oligarchs and tycoons. You don't own your businesses. You manage them on behalf of the state. Sure enough, buy your chateaus in France, build yachts that, that have swimming pools and, 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 and hockey rinks, uh, build palaces on Lake Cuomo, but remember, this, is, this could be taken away from you at any time. Um, and after Khodorkovsky, there were other cases uh, less well known where, where those who did not toe the line went to jail. So this is, this is the economic part. The political part I mentioned, uh, there were um, uh, you know, the hollowing out of the parties, uh, making sort of shells out of, out of the parliament, the, the independent media, and so on and so forth. And of course, the sheer toxicity, uh, this is one of the things that really um, uh, surprised me, the sheer toxicity of the propaganda that Putin unleashed. Again, uh, the, there are all kinds of very dear and familiar faces in this hall for me, and I think they'll agree that this type of, for this type of propaganda, you have to go probably to the late 30s or late 40s under Stalin. Not, certainly not under the late Soviet Union where I grew up. So um, it seems like there may be one parallel between Putin's domestic and his international behavior. And it occurs to me that uh, in a lot of the extraterritorial killings that the Russians state has carried out, it's almost like they've wanted us to see it. Mm -hmm. They wanted us to know it. That mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. it was either a shockingly sloppy tradecraft mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and a surfeit of people falling out of windows, um, or it was purposeful that we were supposed to know. And it sounds like from what you just described, the tradecraft was also supposed to be visible domestically. 
Is well, that a oh, fair sorry. comparison? Uh, definitely, definitely, Alexander Litvinenko. Um, I mean, you 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 don't you don't have to uh, 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 try and, and I mean, you could you could kill, you could poison. You don't have to leave a, an isotope that is only produced in the Soviet uh, well in Russia, right? I mean, you you leave the trace. You tell them this is how it's going to happen. And of course, it happened again in Britain with the former, uh, you know, with the double spy. Uh, who survived, but, but an innocent woman was killed. Um, and so, yes, absolutely, this is, and, and it, it, <laughs> there's a bridge here, of course, to the nuclear blackmail, if you want to talk about this. Um, uh, so so you, you intimidate people inside, but you also intimidate um, the outside world, the so-called West, um, and you intimidate them by, uh, well, there are well-known quotes from Putin about what the end of the world means to him and how the Russians are going to go to paradise while the rest of, the, of them um, could, um, uh, will, will, will die, or Putin used the world's dochnut, which is kick the bucket, uh, without even repenting, um, and, and uh, asked, uh, really, you, you, would, you would initiate um, a, a world uh, wide Armageddon, and he said, what do I need the world for in which there's no Russia? So, so, so th th this, is, this is all, uh, uh, this is all, these are all instances of, of nuclear blackmail. And of course, early this year, he pulls out of New Start. Uh, just the other week, he uh, 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 nullifies the ratification of the nuclear test ban treaty. And of course, uh, as, as you know, I have a, a fairly scary last chapter of this book um, where, where I posit that, that getting out of Ukraine, the war that he could not win, and, and, but also uh, could not away, uh, walk away from, uh, a, a nuclear blackmail appeared to me uh, probably the most plausible uh, thing he can do. Yeah. I do think we are underrating that possibility because I can see three scenarios that might make sense to Putin as Russia loses its war in Ukraine. One is um, as the Ukrainian military picks up uh, momentum in repulsing Russia out of Ukrainian territory, eventually they are going to have to mass troops and mass uh, tanks and equipment, and that becomes a more promising target uh, than the dispersed warfare we have mostly seen up until this point. The second uh, scenario, nuclear scenario, I can see that might make sense to Putin is, uh, you know, as their army gets driven out of Ukraine, uh, a strike on Kyiv that produces the regime change that Putin claims to have gone there for. I can see that. And then the third is the, is the bring the house down. As long as I'm losing and I might lose power as a result of it, uh, what do I care about the world if there is no Russia? Do any of, what's, what's your nightmare scenario? Right, right. Let me add the, the, <laughs> the fourth one to just have the full deck there. <laughs> Uh, uh, scare everybody completely. Uh, so, so my scenario in, in, in the final chapter of, of the book is this. So yes, he's, he, not, I mean, he does not have the wherewithal, he does not have the talent of his, uh, as, as the assassinated Prigozhin illustrated so well, he does not have the talent of, of his generals, he does not, because they're all picked for loyalty, not not talent. Mm -hmm. um, he does not have um, uh, even even enough of of the um, uh, uh, nuclear. I'm sorry, enough of the hardware, military hardware. So so he's stuck in World War One um, uh, situation. He counts on three things. First, that his economy and his society will withstand what's going on. And what is going on is you know on the surface there's no there's no catastrophe, but you know, inflation is 7.5%. Um, they now um, uh, spend 
uh, twice as much on defense as they did before, uh, healthcare, of course, and, 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 and education, all of that uh, uh, fall by, by the wayside. 300,000, at least, um, of the most talented young people left. Um, and there, is a, there, is a, a la there are labor shortages and so on. So, okay, he thinks that he could go on. Uh, the, th the second uh, point he, he, or the second possibility he counts on is that, is that eventually uh, uh, Ukraine is demoralized. That, I mean, how long can you bomb hospitals and schools and cafes and, uh, new, and power stations and, and, and water right, and all of those things, right? And the third, which I think he thinks is the most plausible, is the Ukraine fatigue in the West. So, so those are the three factors that, that he counts on. But then what happens that if none of them, neither of them, or no, no, none of them, none of them works? Well, uh, I think that that's where the nuclear blackmail is going to uh, um, take place. I personally predicted um, a, a lightning attack on, uh, on a uh, smaller country on the eastern uh, part mm -hmm. of uh, easternmost part of of um, NATO, um, Latvia or Estonia, largely because they they have very large uh, Russian minorities, um, and and taking it to the brink, and then saying, "Whoa, let's stop, let's stop, let's pull away." Come on, come on, we are we are you know looking uh, uh, in the precipice. Um, let's step away from the precipice. Let's do an overall settlement. We'll, we'll talk about this. We'll stand down in terms of our nuclear posture. But we have to settle Ukraine as well. And settling Ukraine means you know, ceasefire or truce with, with Russia holding most of its territory. So I want to back up a little bit. We accelerated to the last chapter of the book, and there are a couple of... Uh, couple of planks I still want us to get in place. One is about the role of religion mm. for Putin in this terrorizing of Russian society. You know, he assigned a uh, patron saint to his nuclear forces. Is that right? Uh, yes, and I think we have a photo of, of Putin crossing himself. There we go. Um, so the patron saint is Saint Seraphim of Saraf. Uh, why? Because that's where Beria, uh, the father of uh, a Russian nuclear uh, project, decided to have uh, the headquarters of uh, the Russian nuclear. So this monk, who, who uh, was canonized by Nicholas II early in the 20th century, the monk himself lived in the first third of the 19th century, um, Seraphim of Saraf, um, it is now a patron saint of the Russian nuclear forces. Putin went there twice. Now they're blessing. He's standing to the former um, uh, patriarch, um, that's Alexei, and they, um, they blessed the procession on the 100th anniversary of the saint's canonization by Nicholas II. Um, and then Putin returned again uh, to pray at the relics of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of Saint Seraphim asking for his blessing uh, of the Russian nuclear weapons. And I think we have rather striking images of, oh, there we go. Uh, there they are. Uh, <laughs> uh, there they are. I think there, is this the only one or there's, there's, there's more? Okay, there we go. See? Uh, 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 so one of the many wonderful things about this book is all of the pictures that Leon has included in it, and this is just a taster's menu of them. So, so yes, they're sprinkling holy water on the, nu on the nukes. So this tells you uh, about how really perverse uh, 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 this society, well, not this society, the, the, the regime is. Now, as far as, as far as the role of religion, it was always... Um, you know, ambiguous in Russia. Uh, uh, you know, in, in public opinion polls, you ask them, uh, are you an Orthodox Christian? Oh, yes, you know, 90%. Well, what was the last time you went to church? Um, can't remember. 
so, so, so there are very few active uh, uh, Christians um, in Russia, although, although much, many more, because look at the president, look, look how devoted he is. And in general, Corey, I think it falls into the pattern, you know, after, after um, uh, uh, Ivan the Terrible uh, uh, tortured and killed the last independent uh, 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 metropolit of Moscow, Phil Philip. Um, uh, and, and then Peter the Great completed the breaking of the back of, of the Russian church in, in, I think, 1721 when he established the Holy Synod. He made the church hierarchy uh, 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 the uh, officers of the state. And, and that's how it continued. Um, and this, is, this really fits the pattern. But let me tell you, you know, uh, adding to the things that surprised me, uh, the, the, OK, Alexei sort of died uh, uh, in time uh, uh, bef before or shortly after the, uh, yeah, before the invasion. But, but this current patriarch of all Russia, Kirill, uh, lost all I mean, he is completely shameless. Uh, the, the uh, you know, not all of these, you know, not, not, not just the blessings, but he really does Putin's bidding. You know, the last from, the last from Kirill is that, is that uh, those who are killed uh, in Ukraine will go to paradise. We see vague cross-pollination <laughs> with new BFFs from Iran. <laughs> Uh, no 70 virgins yet, but that may be coming. So, so, so in Russian Orthodoxy, there was never this tradition of, I mean, yes, you, you, know, you, you, you die for the motherland, you're a martyr, that's great, but this thing about you know, going to paradise. So, so this is the state of, of the Russian society. Uh, how much of this is bought by the Russians? How, how fervently they believe? It's hard to ascertain, but I think they were always um, uh, a little skeptical. Remember, this is the country that never went um, through any kind of reformation. In other words, religion was never brought, never became personal, uh, a guide to, to uh, you know, daily behavior. It was always something out there, something that, it's a state religion. Uh, and, and it's both, in that, in that sense, it's both, that's its strength, but it's also its weakness. So um, you argue that that uh, this now that the system is in place, it'll be very hard to shake. And for me, the metric that proves your argument is the most recent figures I saw is that they they are now assessing, uh, the U.S. and other countries are now assessing that up to 200,000 Russian soldiers have either been killed or are badly maimed, and another 200,000, 250,000 injured in the invasion of Ukraine. How is this not creating mm -hmm. a groundswell of opposition to the war? He is going very cleverly about this, Corey. Uh, so let me start with, with the most, the, the crassest uh, uh, sort of factor. The average um, uh, Russian annual salary income, I'm sorry, income, is seven, the equivalent of $795. Um, the median is about $1,100. The families of the soldiers killed in Ukraine get the equivalent of $73,000. This is more than they ever, in their wildest dreams, uh, could imagine. <laughs> the, the paradox of it, that there are villages in Russia that thrived. Yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, it's an unimaginable cynicism. And yet, um, he's gone. Um, it, it's literally in those places that's God forsaken some of the, uh, is what, what is called Monagorada, it became the source of income. I mean, the people finally uh, could repair their homes. They could finally um, get, uh, get a car, a small car. There are, there are only Chinese cars, by the way, left in, in Russia, but it's better than nothing, better than the Russian car. Um, and and um, another thing that he does very cleverly is A, he 
avoids, despite all the clamor of the patriotic bloggers, he, he refuses to have a full mobilization. He announced a partial mobilization. He knows that the full mobilization will be extremely unpopular. Third, if you are an ethnic minority uh, in Dagestan, Chechnya, Mariel, Buratia, a young man there is 70 times more likely to be killed in Ukraine than somebody from Moscow wow. or, or St. Petersburg. This is the statistics from um, uh, 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 Russian pollsters. So you don't go to where the children and grandchildren of the elite are, uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg. And you know, I'm barred from, for life from, uh, from going back. I, I was on the first sanctions list. But okay, my friends- you're just bragging. Yeah, of course, of course. I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting for you to say it. But, uh, but, but, but the, the, so I can't go, but my friends uh, and, and relatives are telling me nothing changed in Moscow. Mm -hmm. There's the same restaurants, people sit in the streets having their cappuccinos and their little omelets. They go for rides. Uh, they, they watch theater. Um, they, they, uh, surprisingly, incidentally, despite the, despite the sanctions, uh, and that's, that's from some of my Italian friends, they're also skiing in the Alps. I mean, I thought, I thought there's, there's a problem with, <laughs> I thought sanctions are for everyone. No, apparently not. So, so those, so he goes very cleverly about this. Yeah. Um, and and uh, there is no groundswell of protest yet. Uh, if there is, you know, if inflation uh, gets heated up, if, if you can no longer, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 get a dishwasher because, because as, as it's happening now, they are <laughs> disemboweled for chips to put in, into the Russian uh, 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 military hardware, um, or if there is a mobilization that begins to touch the children of the elite, yes. Mm -hmm. But so far, again, how long that could go on, we don't know, but, but I don't think there is, a, there is an imminent danger of, of, of domestic uh, um, opposition. So I see a lot of Russian expertise in this room, and I want to leave lots of time for folks to ask questions. And I also see research assistants who worked on this book um, in the room. And I want to uh, give Leon a chance for them to shoot at Leon <laughs> and the book. Uh, but I have one last question before we turn to that, which is what, how has the domestic, uh, the domestic, um, I'm looking for the right word, uh, brutalizing of Russian economy primed them for what they are doing in Ukraine? because uh, it's not clear whether this is just a complete lack of military discipline or, as I think I have heard you argue elsewhere, a natural outgrowth of the culture Putin has created, the war crimes that they are committing in Ukraine. This is not the behavior of a normal military fighting a normal war. So, so uh, Corey, one of the, I mean, there are several uh, weight-bearing structures I, I describe that, that he put in place to support the regime. And one of them uh, is the revival of several Soviet maxims, but also uh, those that he lived by as a street urchin in the slums of the post-war Leningrad, yeah. that, that uh, 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 fear and respect are the same thing, that confidence and aggression, uh, or, or rather I should say confidence comes from aggression. And you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, I, wish I, I wish I thought of it while writing the book. He brutalized that society. Uh, uh, but of course, you know, there are all kinds of examples, right? I mean, a Nazi Germany, uh, Saddam Hussein's um, Iraq. First you brutalized people inside and then that, that toxic mix just sprays out on the world and we see the, we see the results. So no, you're absolutely right. There's a, 
there is a there is a um, uh, clearly an example of it. One of the things, speaking of brutalization, um, I, I, I also I think I, I did write about this as well. There was this stark um, uh, uh, practice uh, introduced by Evgeny Prigozhin of of, um, of Wagner, but apparently uh, spreading widely because it's effective, and that's this what Stalin created in 1942 uh, on a very dire circumstances. Um, it was part of his Nishagu Nazad, not, not a step backward uh, uh, doctrine and, 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 and uh, uh, edict. And um, that meant that you put behind your regular troops, you put the NKVD or Smersh uh, troops with machine guns. And if you so much as turn around, you killed by your own. Yeah. And, and that is what Wagner introduced, and that is what's happening, uh, as far as we know, continues to be the case. And so what kind of, <laughs> what kind of morale, what kind of attitude towards Ukrainian civilians would you expect from these kinds of troops? Mm -hmm. On that grim note, my friends, uh, anybody have any questions for Leon? Let's give Lance Kakonos <laughs> the first shot. Hello, Dr. Aaron. Yes. Good to see you again. Lance was a research assistant yes. for Leon yes. early Hello, on. Dr. Yes, he's, he's, uh, he's recovering safely from the book. <laughs> Is this on? Okay, yeah, okay. Hello, Dr. Aaron. Good to see you again. Excited yes. to see the, the book published. Um, <laughs> I have very fond memories of working many long hours assisting with this, <laughs> and I'm excited to see the final, final result. Um, I have a quick question about something that I know was a major theme of the research, but wasn't discussed too much in this panel, which is sort of like the intergenerational role of children and how that going forward will impact future relations with Russia. Because eventually, if it's tomorrow, a year from now, 10 years from now, the war in Ukraine will end, Putin will die, and there will be some leadership turnover. Now, maybe it'll be someone like Zolotov, another tyrant. But eventually, there must be some sort of transition period that occurs. And when that does, I know through a lot of the research um, that, that you've done, there will be generations at this point, 20 years at least, of children and now young adults who have gone through this patriotic, militarized education. If it's the more than million people that have been through the Unarmia, or the other cadet groups like Vimpel, or if it is the now, I recently learned the existence of the Wagner Yonak, a uh, Wagner group version of the Young Army in schools. Uh, ben, could we show some, uh, uh, yeah, there we go. Like oh. all of this, this militarized consciousness. Yeah, how do this you... is a poster for the 75th anniversary of the, uh, of the uh, victory in World War II. Oh, that's terrible. And how about something from the, from the um, there we go, uh, from, from the uh, uh, Patriot Parks, which were created. There we go. Oh, this, by the way, is the kindergartners demonstrating on the day of, you know, 9th of May. Um, there we go. Terrible. And with these, as everyone can see, leads Okay, to these are Patriot Parks that Putin created all over the country. I think there's another, there, there, that's my favorite. Okay, so thanks very much. So, so this, is, this is the generation uh, that's growing, yes. Um, I just saw an item um, uh, showing that the Russian schools now spend orders of magnitude more on uh, uh, what's known as the initial military training than they spend on uh, the equipment uh, for their physical cabinets or, or, or uh, chemistry cabinets. Um, uh, tens of millions of dollars, I'm sorry, of, of rubles. Uh, they are buying uh, Kalashnikovs, the AK-47. They are buying the mock-up uh, hand grenades. Uh, the children, um, starting with the third grade, sometimes even younger, run around the school with, with Kalashnikovs and, and throw the grenades. Um, 
this is a completely a militarized society. Let's not forget also, Lance, what they're taught in schools. Again, uh, uh, harking back to my misspent youth, um, the, I, in, in the textbooks, uh, history textbooks that we studied in high school, uh, Stalin was not mentioned, uh, which was, of course, a huge problem, but, but he was not mentioned. In the newly published uh, um, uh, um, textbook by a guy by the name of Medinsky, who is, used to be very appropriately Putin's minister of culture, um, not only Stalin is mentioned, but Stalin is back. Uh, he is the wise leader of the country. They study his speeches. Uh, not a word about the gulag, not a word about the great famine or collectivization, um, and of course, nothing about the first two years of the war uh, uh, that, that, that was nearly, that, well, the war that was nearly lost, World War II, uh, because A, of the purge of, of uh, the Red Army, and also because of his trust in Hitler. So, so Stalin is back, he's a wise father of the country, and most of all, he is the great victor in uh, World War II, uh, or as the Russian called it, almost always the Great Patriotic War. So, so this, is the, this is a scary generation. Uh, and um, God knows. Um, again, uh, my hope, um, uh, Corey, is that, is that different elites coming to power would, might turn even that generation around. You know, for any, and, and, and I know there are lots of people in this room who remember August of 91, where tens of thousands came to defend the so-called White House, Yeltsin, um, and defeated the coup. Uh, this, these are the same people. Well, I mean, not literally. These, these are probably the fathers or even grandfathers of, of this current generation. But it shows that, 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 that Russia is not dead to, to the nobility of democracy and nobility of freedom. Um, and, and the only hope I have is that, is that new leaders uh, will, will go back to that, to that magnificent moment in Russian history. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Harley Balzer from Georgetown University. Lovely to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, the, the economic stuff is beginning to hit a little bit. If you read today's conversation, uh, the cost of renovating your apartment has gone up 40 or 50 percent. Uh, the Ministry of Health just announced something like 400 medicines they're no longer going to be making. Uh, so that stuff is going to trickle down. But what I really want to ask you about is what some of us are calling the Putin paradox. The what? Uh, the Putin paradox. Yeah, right. Uh, Anders Aslan and I are two of the 14 authors in a book we're calling Failure, Russia Under Putin. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're grappling with is the contradiction between the massive corruption and the rebuilding of great Russia. Uh, you know, Putin himself has got, what, two, three trillion dollars? It's phenomenal amounts of money. Uh, the more you put into the defense industry, the more it goes away. Uh, how do we reconcile that seeming contradiction? Well, Harley, I mean, uh, th that corrupt leaders could build strong armies? Is that, is that what you think is the, is the paradox? <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, what's known as atkate, which is a kickback, of course. And of course, let's, let's Play Evgeny Prigozhin. He'll tell you everything you need to know about corruption in 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 the Russian army, in the general staff. Um, as you said, I mean, if you throw billions of rubles um, at 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 the defense sector, uh, you know, some part of it is actually effective. Uh, the rest is stolen. Um, so. So that, that I think, uh, is prob probably explains it. We know of, of by the way, in, in, this, in the Soviet days, I mean, military was also among the most corrupt uh, sectors, but there was not as much to steal. So, so uh, that, that sort of put a limit to it. But I think that he, he knows that this is going on. 
uh, again, uh, I think Prigozhin spoke uh, from his heart um, uh, when, when he pointed out to, to immense incompetence and, and corruption in, in the higher echelons of, of the Russian armed forces. But I think the, the, you know, the idea here, I think for Putin to tackle corruption is to tackle one of the foundations of his regime. As I mentioned, uh, you know, he, he discovered that unlike his much admired Soviet uh, uh, predecessors, um, uh, admired by him, uh, he, um, he, he realized that you could be actually more effective by bribing than by terrorizing. Because, because if, if, if you give them something and, and, and they buy, oh, they steal enough to have um, essentially upper middle class European lives or better, um, and then you threaten to take it away, it's just as effective or even more effective than terror. Next, right here. Thank you very much. Christian Faust, the Hans Seidel Foundation. Yeah, so Hans Seidel Foundation, we had to shut down our office you know, last year after, after uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine. Thanks for this fascinating talk. So my question is, uh, why there is no really resistance yeah, within the Russian elite yeah, to Putin? How do you explain, like, Sergei Kirienko, yeah, who started as a reformer, is now so entrenched yeah, in this Putin power structure? Putin, when he rose to power, he was perceived as someone who had to balance varying interests. Yeah? The Petersburg, the KGB, the Yeltsin elite, the 90th oligarchs and whatever. Is he now only one supported by this KGB elite? Yeah? Does he have to balance power structures anymore? So why there is no um, resistance to Putin? And do you see it coming from business elites anytime? So, so uh, I, I tried to touch on this. Uh, most of them were bribed, some of them were intimidated, and, and all of them were intimidated and bribed. So, so the, the, um, th that is where you stand. Yes, indeed, he, um, he was, again, he was very clever about this. Yes, the coterie around him, the enforcers, are all the um, uh, KGB officers that, that uh, were with him in Leningrad in the mid-70s, late 70s. Um, uh, 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 Patrushev, Bastrykin, um, they, all of them are actually now um, are, are quite high in, in the top echelon. And I think he trusts them the most. Um, others, as I mentioned, after Khodorkovsky, I mean, you want to rebel and go to through two trials and spend 10 years in jail, um, be my guest. Um, no, uh, that is not going to happen. The elite itself, I think uh, the most plausible scenario, I would think, would be some catastrophic defeat in Ukraine, uh, where, where they may decide that this is something that in other words, they're coming after us. That 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 not only we sanctioned we're sanctioned by the West, but but the regime will change and we will have to answer to it. Remember, in in uh, in Russian history, uh, military defeats um, lead to a lot of domestic change. I mean, the the first Crimean War. Uh, so Nicholas uh, I dies, his son initiates a revolution from above, including, of course, the liberation of the serfs. Um, uh, the problem with oh, the Russo-Japanese War leads to the first constitution. Um, the, the setbacks in World War I, the Bolshevik uh, Revolution, uh, uh, Khrushchev falls from power in part because of the embarrassment in Cuba. And, and of course, the, uh, the uh, morass of Afghanistan uh, was, a, was one of the factors in, in Gorbachev's uh, revolution from above. So, so if they feel that, that um, not only they're stuck in Ukraine, but that, that things are really becoming dicey, maybe 
maybe. Um, on the other hand, I mean, it all depends. Then forget about bribery, then it's sheer terror. I mean, remember, uh, uh, Stalin gave a very interesting speech at, um, at, at, uh, in June of 1945, right, Charles? <laughs> uh, the tribute to the Russian people. But the way he said it was very interesting. He said, we had horrific disasters. We, the government, made horrific mistakes in 1941 and 1942. But the Russian people, specifically Russian people, had enough trust in the government and enough patience to uh, trust that we would turn the situation around. Now, he was genuinely, from what I could see, he was genuinely surprised. He said, by the way, that any other people would have rebelled and made peace with Germany and said, go away because, because you don't know how to fight this war. So the question for Putin, and of course, you know, he's channeling Stalin in so many uh, different rhetorical ways, is whether the Russian people have that patience and that trust. Now, of course, it, under the worst of circumstances, the war of, uh, uh, you know, in Ukraine is not going to turn in the you know, existential crisis of 1941-1942 of the Nazi invasion. But I think the question may still remain. How long can the Russian people trust the government? How long they can bear the, so far, uh, uh, not the shame uh, of, of the defeat, but what if it, if, if it gets close to it? And I think, and I think then uh, you may see that the elites, the elites uh, follow, follow the people, I think, for the most part, certainly in Russia, rather than the other way around. I think we have time for one last question. Dr. Gotti, it's yours. You walked right past No, no, me. right behind you, right behind you. Uh, Charles Gatti, uh, what a wonderful panel. Thank you so much. Uh, my, your last chapter, as you summarized, it scares the daylight out of me. Uh, I mean, I'm an old guy, but I have 11 grandchildren. Uh, uh, so my question is, how deep is your conviction that your analysis is about correct? That my analysis is what? Your analysis about a nuclear... Uh, exchange as a possibility or probability, how, yeah, how strong is your conviction? Uh, well, thanks for the question, Charles, my <laughs> professor from Columbia University, my <laughs> beloved professor. Um, the, um, uh, uh, thanks for the question also because I need to make, uh, 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 make it more precise. Yeah. I think that Putin will take it to the brink, but not the actual uh, uh, nuclear Armageddon. Some, some, of the, some of the Russian, certainly, uh, but even Western uh, experts said that he may go for to explode a tactical nuke uh, uh, away from, from a, a, you know, a, um, a, a, a key population center, uh, maybe somewhere in Estonia, somewhere in Poland. I mean, horrible enough. But I think that would fall into <laughs> that that uh, wonderful escalate to de-escalate uh, doctrine that some say exists, some say doesn't exist, but basically when you're desperate, uh, uh, detonate a, a tactical weapon, and of course this is could be anywhere from uh, 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 you know five kiloton or or a third of the Hiroshima uh, or or up to a hundred kilotons, um, and 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 then and then step back and, and de-escalate. Everybody steps back. So uh, I don't think it will come to a um, actually strategic nuclear exchange with the United States. I think he will take it as far as possible um, to get the effect that he wants, which is let's settle in Ukraine, let's settle here, but I, but, but uh, you know, the, the, when, when, when you get the book, which I will inscribe for you, <laughs> uh, uh, you'll see uh, there's a wonderful uh, uh, um, epigraph uh, from Margaret Yosinar's terrific book, uh, uh, The Memoir of Hydrion. Uh, let me read it to you. 
He had reached that moment in his life when a man abandons himself to his demons or to his genius, following a mysterious law which bids him either to destroy or outdo himself. And I'm afraid uh, Putin may be reaching this kind of stage. Um, I would like to end on a more hopeful note, which is to point out that our choices um, can also very strongly affect those potential outcomes. And we are doing some things to try and dissuade Putin from thinking it would be in his interest. There is much more we can and should do to affect the range of choice that Putin, the people around him, and the people who would be carrying out any such orders think about the consequences of their choices. And on that cheery note, my friends, thank you first to Edward and Helen Hintz, whose generosity to this institution is manifold, and we are super grateful for their support of our scholarship and of this book series. Second, to all of you for making time to come out and celebrate Leon's outstanding book. And lastly, to the great Leon Aaron himself. <laughs> Won't you join me in thanking him? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.